inviting me. And uh, yeah, so um, what I want to do is to look more at the archaeological output in museum setting and to question, you know, what is the ultimate output of an archaeological investigation uh, using the Mary Rose as a case study. I won't go into the history, you'll be delighted to know, and it's not uh, all about elite persons, Henry VIII here, uh, but just in terms of the history, to get you in the right century, Mary Rose, uh, 1511 to 1545, it did not sink on its maiden voyage, okay? It was a very successful warship for 34 years before it sank in the Solent, uh, defending Britain against a massive French invasion fleet, which was actually bigger than the Spanish Armada. They're already uh, pillaging and burning villages on the Isle of Wight. And this is the English fleet coming out of Portsmouth, recorded in a contemporary uh, picture. At the centre of the image, we see South Sea Castle, and Henry VIII is actually watching, and sadly, the Mary Rose actually um, uh, capsizes and sinks in his, uh, in his vision. So it's a, it's a really great calamity of the day. But that's enough about history. I won't even go into the sinking, uh, except perhaps in the pub over lunchtime, because it would take too long. But my theory is that it would have been a combination of factors. So we're going to go straight into after the ship had sunk. And uh, what I think is really important, we're starting on the archaeology here, is how we can see the deterioration process through the archaeology. So if you can imagine, it's very murky in the Solent, so silts are suspended in the water, and they can come in through the open gun ports and start filling up the ship. Once they're inside the ship, they can just settle down uh, like dust in the attic or like ash at Herculaneum or Pompeii. So they very quickly filled up the inside of the ship, and the part that was exposed that I show you on the last slide was gradually um, uh, eroded away by uh, being eaten by Torido Navalis, a very voracious shipworm, until the whole thing was, the whole of one side had completely collapsed, but the lower side was preserved in the anaerobic silts of the Solent and was then eventually covered by more recent deposits so that the whole thing was completely sealed below the seabed. So although I'm slightly digress digressing here, I wanted to show you the, the stratigraphy on the site because it's absolutely amazing. There is a, uh, an audio for this, but it's uh, me with a very plummy voice 30 years ago. <laughs> no, luckily it's not even there. But I mean, just look at, you can see all these layers. And this is on an archaeological site underwater. There's about three metres of very good stratigraphy showing the different layers, showing uh, both the Tudor layers at the very bottom and the more modern layers on top. And we, um, th it was in such good condition, we could record it, we could uh, photograph it, we could even preserve some of it. And in the museum, we do tell this story in the archaeology gallery about the, the layers of history. And I was delighted to see the, uh, the Clay Pipe Research Society downstairs. They, they'd be interested in our clay pipes. But we've got all that archaeology showing the, you could say, the inhabitation of that site in the Solent over the last 500 years as well as the precious treasure of the Mary Rose. In fact, I was delighted to see um, one of the magazines, History Revealed, is it, or History Today, voted today, I, I learned on my emails this morning, it's been voted as the third most important archaeological discovery ever after Tutankhamun and the Terracotta Warriors. I, I couldn't believe that when I looked at my emails. Today. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. You know, ahead of, I don't know, Olduvai Gorge or Lucy or whatever, or Machu Picchu, I mean, just, and Herculaneum that I mentioned. I'm, I was just really delighted by, by that, but it's been recognised as one of the great archaeological discoveries. So, um, I came on the scene in 1979, which doesn't quite seem possible now uh, that I look so young, but um, uh, I was a graduate and I just happened to have read archaeology at university and I had diving qualifications, so I was in the right place at the right time. And the objectives of the May Rose Trust were really quite phenomenal back in 1979. To find, record, excavate, <coughs> raise, bring ashore, publish, report on, preserve and display for all time in Portsmouth, the May Rose, all for the education and benefit of the nation. And gradually, over the last 37 years, we've been ticking off each of these objectives in turn. I'm not going to go through them all, but I'll just mention a couple of them. Even the conservation was an enormous feat of human endeavour, as was the excavation, the raising it, and all the research. Spraying with uh, fresh water, then polyethylene glycol, and finally, recently, the air drying. 
uh, the main air drying program finished in 2016, and that enabled us to open the new museum that I'm going to show you in a minute. But also one of the things I mentioned, to publish, to report on. This is, you know, back, perhaps back more onto the theme of this conference, about what we do with the results of our archaeological investigations. Um, and the, uh, the brief also asks us to think about the, you know, the highs and lows of our work. And I think one of the lows was in the sort of 1990s, when we still had this enormous backlog of publication. But I'm delighted to say, actually with help of the uh, Heritage Lottery Fund, uh, they gave us their first ever grant to help us uh, with just some of the expenses of the publication. And that really sort of focused the mind to get this publication done. So in the uh, 90s and early noughties, we, we produced our main um, academic uh, and part, part popular publication of all the archaeological work. And in a way, that was a great load off our shoulders. And it enabled us to then think about what I think are the real outcomes of our archaeological process, which is to display for all time in Portsmouth, the Mary Rose, all for the education and benefit of the nation, as you saw in those early objectives. So that's what I want the main part of this talk to be about, is how do we do that? How do we try and make an archaeological excavation relevant for a 21st century audience? I actually love experimental archaeology. I think it really helps when you can show the public, not just talk about futtock seam covering pieces and, and, and rising floors, but actually create them in front of the eyes of the public. Here using traditional techniques, adzes and axes, to hew a piece, the crook t a piece of timber from a, a tree into a rising floor. And here's more of it being done there. Using a pit saw over trestles to saw some of the planks on the Mary Rose. What we did is we created different parts of the ship using uh, three of the traditional methods that were used in those times, hewing, sawing, and finally cleaving. This was the most exciting thing, just getting a, an oak tree and cleaving it in half, and then getting a half, cleaving it into quarters, eighths, sixteenths, thirty seconds, and by then you almost have, you can see, a weatherboard plank here, which is exactly what we had in the upper structures of the Mary Rose. But to see that going on, and bringing that alive to the public in demonstrations, this happens to be at a Festival of the Sea in 2016, uh, sorry, uh, in Bristol. Um, uh, seeing the sights and sounds of a Tudor ship, shipyard, this is what I think helps to bring the public alive for, uh, for uh, a 21st century audience, for a modern audience. Not necessarily those great book stoppers that we have, which is our academic publication. Another project uh, that we did was the, was the galley, to create a reconstruction of the galley. So we took the original uh, photographs. In fact, I, we did the, this excavation in 1982, but I only did the analysis of the results in 1995, looking through all the records, the photographs, the drawings, all those uh, site recording forms we've heard about earlier, to recreate um, a, uh, a, uh, a reconstruction of this galley. So uh, this shows the first bricks that were found. It was literally like a rubble pile of bricks. If that, if that picture was there, they would go up to the ceiling, this rubble pile of bricks, with another two metres of silt above that, which we'd already dug through. But underneath this enormous rubble pile of bricks, we found one of the two uh, uh, brick furnaces with a cauldron on top in fairly intact condition. And from that, we were able to make a, uh, I think it's a pretty well 98% accurate reconstruction on paper of what the, uh, the ship's ovens, the ship's galley would have looked like. And from then, we made a modern, uh, reconstruction using modern bricks. And it's really when you only start to do this that you can understand how something was built and how it could have been used on board a ship. And this created an enormous amount of public interest, but not nearly as much as when we actually started cooking on it. Um, to actually cook on a Tudor Arga, it was called in the papers, was absolutely amazing. And what we were able to do is to show how they could possibly have cooked, not just for uh, 500 members of the crew, but also 35 officers using different methods of cooking. It looks like a very crude uh, cauldron, but actually you can then cook food for the officers inside the, 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 the crew's 
broth, like a bain-marie. We also found we had a convector oven on the front of this thing. We've got a radiant uh, uh, oven that you can use casseroles and things on. So this sort of thing, to me, is really helping to publish the results of our work in a way relevant to our public. So in our, uh, something that we do now actually finally getting onto the museum, one of the things that we do in the archaeology gallery in the museum is to show the, you know, how things looked like when we first excavated them. Okay, it didn't look like this and we couldn't see it because of the very bad visibility. But imagine that with another few thousand bricks piled on top of that and then the silts above that I was talking about. In the archaeological process, we find things in this sort of chaotic state but then what we've done is to juxtapose this display or showing you know, the, the sort of rubbish and rubble in which you find something with a reconstruction, this time not using modern bricks, but using the actual Tudor bricks that we found on the ship. Um, you can see the wonderful entrance to the ovens here. Uh, we've even got 700 logs. We've actually got the logs that we used to power this fire. Nobody else in the world has 700 Tudor firewood logs, do they? You know, Hampton Court, they burnt all theirs. Uh, we've got the only ones, and they're, they're birch, and they've got, even got the bark. In fact, this, I love this object. It's a chopping block, but I hope you can just see from the back even the marks of the Tudor uh, cook who, you know, chopped up the, the meat on this block. And seeing things like the marks of, of cleavers and knives on chopping blocks, that, to me is what brings the past to life. I also love this because there were two of these on board and because of a trick of reflection in this internal um, glass wall here, you can actually see the reflection of the second one and that's exactly how it was on the May Rose. One on the port side, one on the starboard side with the keel in between. Um, so this is sort of, as I said, how we juxtapose the archeology span um, with what it would have looked like back in, 20, uh, back in uh, 1545. The other thing, as we'll see at the mo uh, in a moment, is that we juxtapose the thousands of objects opposite the ship. So this is displayed exactly opposite where we find it in the ship. Context is all important, and although we don't use that word, showing the, the objects in the ship in the context of the ship is one of the really important things about the Mary Rose uh, Museum display. It's all about archaeology, even though there's just two galleries in which we sort of blatantly talk about archaeology. And what we're trying to do is to bring to life these people from 1545. And it's a pity because it's become a bit of a cliche, you know, bringing things to life. But that is certainly what we try to do uh, in the Mary Rose Museum. We try to tell stories about all these people in the ship, on the main deck here, yes, we've got guns, we've got iron guns, we've got bronze guns, but we've also got a cabin with all the carpenter's equipment, the carpenter's cabin, we've got the surgeon's cabin, we've got the navigator's cabin, and we can tell stories about this people. Our museum, it's not about a ship, it's about real people, and we can tell the stories about real people. But we also like to show how much stuff there was in this, in this ship. You know, this, this museum displays, it's not about showing one wonderful 16th century pot that expresses everything to do with pots in that period. It's about showing all this stuff that was found on board, the magnitude of all this stuff. So I've called this the, the living ship, and we've, we've got thousands of objects that are intensely personal. They can tell us the stories about the people, and they illustrate life at all levels of society. I mean, you know, most of the museums or public houses or palaces you go to, they, they tell you about the rich people. You know, we heard earlier, they, they tell you about the elite persons. This is about uh, stories about everyday people. Um, so, oh, we still, I wondered if that was my war, one of my warnings. Let's hope that can disappear. Thank you very much. Uh, so we're telling personal stories. Oh. No, we're not. Right, so what we do is we put groups of personal objects together. For instance, where we found a chest underwater, we're pretty sure they belong to one person because they've got one comb in them, one pair of shoes, one dagger, one book or whatever. Um, and we have these in people cases. So eight of the cases around the museum are just based on one person or in a couple of cases on two people to tell those individual stories. We don't shy away from displaying human remains and we've dedicated the museum to the crew. 
So we've got these wonderful objects. In fact, it made me think you've probably seen the Tutankhamun uh, films on the television. I mean, looking in that museum or opening a chest for the very first time underwater, it's about seeing these wonderful things. Here's uh, a bowl, uh, you know, with Fred, his mark, on here. Shoes, but not just pairs of shoes, but look at that shoe. That's one of my favourite objects in the whole exhibition. You can empathise with that Tudor sailor from 1545, whose feet had such a problem that he wore through his shoes very, very quickly. We've got extraordinarily ordinary things. We've got, um, we've got rosaries. I have to show this because my wife found this as an amateur diver. We had a great tradition of using amateur divers on the May Rose, and she found that. And it's just so beautifully tactile, and yet it gives us insights into the Reformation. You know, this is the king's ship in 1545. You know, eight years earlier, you were banned from using these to tell your prayers by rote. Um, and yet we find eight or nine of them actually on board the ship from the sinking. So interpreting for a 21st century audience. As I say, one thing is that we juxtapose thousands of the objects opposite the ship, opposite where they were found. So, for instance, just this is uh, just giving you a bit of an idea. This is the whole ship. If we take away half the ship, because we show it like a doll's house, we then turn it round to show that people are going to see it from the stern. This is now showing how much of the ship actually survived. Then you can imagine thousands of objects on board the ship, and we've sort of built a gallery opposite the ship on which we show those thousands of objects. Um, so another thing that we do is we project films onto the ship so that people can uh, sort of see the people and the objects in the ship. What we've done in the museum is combine people, ship and objects. But we only do this for two minutes every seven minutes so that you can just look at the bare ship and uh, see it on its own, but then it's brought to life for a couple of minutes every seven minutes. And it's, it's this sort of thing that helps to bring the ship al uh, 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 alive. Uh, this sort of shows them, but they don't actually show very well in a, in a static video. And this shows the sorts of things that we, we show. But it's meant for viewing from a distance rather than close up like this. But, you know, we had young boys as young as 10 and 12 working on board. And it just gives a bit of an idea of some of the things that were happening in the ship as you look at it. So, for instance, here people are using a, um, a grindstone to sharpen their knives. But if you look at behind you in the museum, you'll see the actual grindstone on its mount that we found on the Mary Rose. So we're, we're trying to juxtapose the one with the other. So what I hope that I've done here is to introduce some of the concepts that were noted on the learning outcomes. What I'd hope to illustrate in the words of the learning outcomes are that there is a great wide variety of forms beyond grey literature that dissemination and publication may take such as museum-based display, uh, uh, experimental archaeology, and so on. And I hope there'll be time, either now or over coffee or lunch, to ask me questions. But thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you.